Okay, I'm going to talk to you about insulin. So, what is it? Well, it is a peptide hormone or a hormone peptide, depending on how you want to say it. Commonly known for the treatment of diabetes, which is the inability to produce enough insulin, resulting in high blood sugar levels or hypo, hyper, sorry, glycemia. Um, effectively, what insulin does is it shuttles glucose, amino acids, and fatty acids into cells. Therefore, it is a very anabolic agent. But it also preserves these elements as well, making it anti-catabolic. Now, um, those properties alone it is no surprise that it's interested or it's interest to athletes. Coupled with that, that it is very difficult to detect in uro and urine analysis. You can understand why people turn to it. You join that with anabolics, and the synergistic effect is quite high. So there you go. Moved into the middle for those with OCD. Um, obviously, we've now got upregulated protein synthesis from the anabolics, among other things, and a nutritional shuttling process far above what is natural. This results in massive transition of nutrition, speeded recovery, and therefore speeded growth. Now, commonly, the first port of call for taking insulin is post-workout. The reason for this is this is a point when we are looking to speed up recovery massively. Uh, cellular muscular tissue is very sensitive to insulin post-workout, and this helps drive nutrition in. The second port of call for most people is pre-workout. Now, in this case, you'd be taking insulin with some carbs, depending on how your diet is structured as well, which I'll get onto in a minute, and then a massive amount of aminos in order to, again, drive nutrition in. If you just take carbs with your insulin pre-workout, you'll get a massive pump, but that's going to be about it. Now, insulin does not make you fat. Okay, calories and fats make you fat. So, if you control your diet and your fat level or your fat intake is low, then there's less chance of insulin driving fat into adipose tissue and more chance of it driving glucose and amino acids into muscular cells. So there you go. Okay. The biggest issue that people fuck up with insulin mainly is that they try and match their diet and their calorie intake to their insulin intake instead of doing it the opposite way around. Excess calories are going to make you fat whichever way you look at it, so it doesn't matter how you do that. In fact, you can very successfully diet, and I've seen quite a few people successfully diet for competitions, on insulin. So insulin itself does not make you fat. It's your diet you control around your insulin use that is the problem. Now, for a vast majority of people, they will decide they're going to take so many IUs of insulin and therefore decide that they need so many uh, grams of carbs. And depending on where you speak to, this can range dramatically. But that's not actually the case. Very factors fall into this, your own natural insulin sensitivity, the carb intake throughout the day, the source of the carbs that you are using, how much energy you expend during the day, a point of day at which you train, etc., 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 so, it is a bit of an ad hoc method, but it does actually work quite well. If you're going to start taking insulin, the first thing you need to make sure is that your diet and your day is structured. You need to make sure that your meal timings are regular and that they are exact and the same every time. You can't be taking insulin and then being half an hour late with a meal. That is crucial. So, say we're going to decide to take insulin post-workout. Start with one or two IU and build it up by an IU every time. Make sure someone is aware of what you're doing and make sure there's someone around you at all times when you first start using this stuff. When you start to feel the symptoms of hypo, which we'll get into in a minute, bang some glucose tablets in, dial your insulin back a couple of IUs, and then you've matched your insulin to your current dietary requirements. It is ad hoc but it actually works very, very effectively. If you're going to take it pre-workout, things get a little bit more risky because obviously expenditure during workout can vary somewhat, uh, particularly from workout to workout. Generally, you can expend more calories on legs than you are on, on other things. 
And so you have to balance your carb timings with your expenditure to make sure you don't go hypo halfway through a session. And trust me, going hypo under 700 kilo leg press is no fucking fun thing to do. So there you go. Um, now, going back to the signs of hypo, these vary from person to person, but in general, you will get sweaty. You can do that in a gym anyway, but it can be like a cold sweat, a clammy sweat. You'll feel dizzy, temperature fluctuations, pins and needles in the hands, the feet, numbness tingling in the lips, in the tongue, metallic taste in the mouth, disorientation, anger, mood issues, fuzziness, a sort of cotton wool head, um, less responsive, less communicative. Worst case scenario is a loss of consciousness. Now you've got to be a pretty damn fucking idiot to knock yourself out using insulin. You really do have to be a bit of a retard. But that's not to say that you can't impair your function. Do that whilst driving, and that can have very dangerous consequences. This shit is not something you want to take lightly, and it's not something you want to mess around with if you don't know what you're doing. Tread very, very carefully, and make sure that you have someone around you who's very aware of what you're doing, and make sure you have glucose tablets on standby at all times. You can't be taking this and then saying, I'll get something to eat in a minute, and then a minute becomes 10, 15, 20, half an hour to an hour later, and you still haven't eaten, you're going to have problems. Now, a little bit of a history lesson. It was invented in 1920, invented by a guy called Fred Banting, and it is accredited to an assistant called Charles Best. Now, Fred approached the University of Toronto, I believe it was, and a guy called J.J.R. McLeod. McLeod wasn't particularly interested. He let him choose an assistant. The assistant he chose to chose was best. They initially started extracting this from dog pancreases. Uh, they soon rang out of the university supplies and went on the streets pinching strays. Not particularly ethical, I know. They later discovered you could use pig and sheep and uh, then for at a steady and constant supply. In fact, a large amount of uh, insulin still manufactured today is extracted from pig and sheep pancreas. Uh, in 1922, the first diabetic was treated and it was successful. There were lots of issues with um, contaminants, protein reactions and such like. The purification process wasn't the best. Uh, it won the no 1923 Nobel Peace Prize. However, the Peace Prize was awarded to Branton and um, McLeod. Best complained, as well did a chemist that helped with the extraction process, and the Peace Prize was subsequently shared between the four of them. At the same time, a Danish scientist whose wife suffered from diabetes. Now you can remember at this point diabetes treatment was treated literally by starvation. So the diabetes didn't kill the person, the malnutrition did. Uh, his wife was suffering with diabetes so he looked to um, coming up with insulin as well. He uh, formed a company called Nordisk, now Nova Nordisk, whilst uh, Branting and Best went to Lilly. Lilly is still the biggest manufacturer of insulin products in the world, followed by Nova Nordisk. Now, by the 1930s, long acting started to appear, and it was all fast acting. Um, by the 1950s, the purification was improved. But it wasn't until 1975 when CBA came out with a <coughs> excuse me, synthetic version. And still to this day, your insulin is either going to be synthetic or it will be animal derivative. Obviously, the purification process is a lot better now. Generally, it comes in 100 IU per mil, but it is available in other strengths and can come in as much as 500 IU per mil. So you need to look at what you're using and make sure you're aware of its strength. Now, it comes as a fast actor a medium actor, a slow actor, and a blend, generally speaking. However, each manufacturer produces a product that works on its own timescales, and the range is quite massive. Peak times on fast acting can be anything from 30 minutes to 3 hours, and it can last in your system from 3 hours to 8 hours. So why is this a problem? Well, 
some people choose to take insulin with every meal, small amounts to help with the absorption of food, particularly they're struggling to put high calorie diets away. It's going to have an accumulative effect. So if you've got insulin that's hanging around for five to eight hours in your system, by the time you get to your third, fourth, fifth meal of the day, you're going to have quite high levels of insulin. That can result in a very high insulin level pre-bed. And the last thing you want to be doing is going into a fasted state with high levels of insulin. You're going to potentially put yourself into a coma. So you need to be aware of its duration in the body. And you also need to be aware of its speed of peak due to timings for food. You don't want to be taking insulin an hour and a half before a workout if you want it to peak during the workout for maximum nutritional transit while you're training. So it is important that you know these things. Now, the intermediates to long actings can have peak times of anything from 5 to 18 hours and can last in your system for in excess of 24 hours. There's even one uh, a large gene by Lantus that doesn't have a peak. It flatlines and stays stable for about 24 hours. So you really need to be aware of what you're using. The make, its timings, and its dosage. Now, side effects. Obviously, the main thing, the main issue is hypos. But as I said, you've got to be a pretty fucking big idiot to make yourself unconscious using this shit. But that doesn't mean you can't impair your judgment or your ability to do other things, which in turn can cause accidents. So be very, very careful. You can get some increased fat tissue around the injection site. So you're going to need to rotate your site. And you can actually be allergic to this stuff. Uh, obviously, we produce it naturally, but you're talking about a lot higher levels. Uh, if you come out in hot rashes, itchiness, anything like that, chances are you are allergic and you're just not going to be able to use the stuff at all. Other problems. Ah, excuse me. I would recommend that you buy a new sink for an insulin pen. It's a lot better and more accurate way to deliver this stuff. It needs to be getting a cool, dark place, refrigerated when not in use. It does have a shelf life. It doesn't go off as such, but it will weaken in strength. So, And it's relatively cheap, so there's no real reason why you need to hold on to old stuff. Just get rid. Okay. Um, over time, it can make you insulin resistant. So, idea is to cycle this stuff. Uh, and I would recommend that you do some sort of ketonic diet or definitely look at products like berberine to improve insulin sensitivity post use. It's very good as a bridging drug. Um, it's very, very useful to use in between cycles. So you use your cycle and then you go on to insulin for your downtime, whether you cruise or you PCT, which is whatever you do. Therefore, you still have a very active anabolic agent in your system. But like I said, I can't warn you enough be careful, educate yourself. If you cannot stick to strict timings with your meals, then this is not for you. And do not match your food to your drugs. Match your drugs to your food. Set your diet and your calorie intake as to where you want it to be for what goal you want to achieve. And then manipulate those numbers around your insulin use if you need to. The most general protocol would be post-workout. There are studies showing high insulin peaks with just whey protein post-workout, but personally, from my own experience, there is a difference. The level you can reach with insulin post-workout is a lot greater. And generally what I find as well is you'll find that you'll be able to put an extra meal in post-workout very, very quickly as well. Pre-workout, massive, massive pumps, good nutritional flow, However, there is the danger of having a bit of a dicky turn while you train. If you're going to do it through the day, then you need to track and be aware of an accumulative effect over time. Okay, that's pretty much it. Um, stay safe and I'll catch up with you soon.